Good morning and welcome to today's MPG Primer. I am very excited to introduce uh, Dr. Kim Lagerborg. She's, or sorry, uh, Kim Lagerborg, who is a PhD candidate, very soon to be doctor, uh, in the biological and biomedical science program at Harvard University. Her work in the Sabeti lab is primarily focused on engineering uh, tissue specific adeno associated virus capsid variants for gene therapy applications. However, with the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, she switched gears to focus on genomic surveillance of this pathogen. Here, she worked with a team to add synthetic DNA spiking controls to SARS-CoV-2 sequencing workflows to enable sample tracking and detection of intersample contamination. We are very excited to hear about her important work that I know has helped us all um, as a community to know more about the pandemic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for the intro and Diane for asking me to speak. Um, today, I will be discussing how we developed and implemented synthetic DNA spikins, SDSIs, for sample tracking and detecting contamination in SARS-CoV-2 sequencing workflows. Please feel free to ask questions throughout, as I do not anticipate my slides taking up more than half of today's time. So as we all know, SARS-CoV-2 case counts have continued to increase across the world and new variants continue to evolve. When the first COVID-19 cases were detected, a technique called unbiased metagenomic sequencing was used to characterize the virus and the first genome was quickly published. Viral genomic surveillance provides insights into the diversity, evolution, and transmission of a virus and serves as a critical guide for public health interventions ranging from contact tracing, identifying cases of reinfection, or understanding the basis of resistance to clinical interventions. Metagenomic sequencing is where you essentially take everything that is in a sample and sequence it. This is great for you need no prior knowledge of what is in the sample and you can easily detect co-infections. Additionally, it is seen as more unbiased and results in accurate genomes. Our lab has used this approach to sequence numerous other pathogens, so we were quite familiar with it. Early in the pandemic, when labs were shut down, a small group of people from our lab were allowed to continue working. We focused on rapidly expanding automation to scale up our methods to sequence SARS-CoV-2. However, as case counts kept increasing and more and more samples arrived, we began to transition towards another technique called multiplexed amplicon sequencing. Multiplexed amplicon sequencing was needed not only to increase throughput for sequencing surveillance, but it also gave a much needed boost in sensitivity. With metagenomic sequencing, most of the sequencing reads ends up going towards human background, uh, with only a small percentage going towards the intended target. This means in order to recover those genomes, we must sequence more deeply and cannot pull as many samples into one run. Amplicon sequencing is also able to recover genomes from samples with lower viral loads, i.e. higher CT samples, due to its more targeted nature. In Amplicon sequencing, you take two or more pools of primers that cover your genome of interest by creating a series of tiled amplicons and then use PCR for amplification. The extra sensitivity occurs since you only amplify and sequence the genome of interest. However, although beneficial, we also worried about contamination with this approach due to the numerous cycles of virus-specific PCR. The PCR reaction generates trillions of copies of these amplicons, and without proper controls, they can easily contaminate the work environment and other samples. A recent example of this is Deltacron, um, a possible variant that was found to be just a lab contamination event. Deltacron illustrates the importance of having quality control measures in place to prevent the misinterpretation of genomic data. Amplicon, as of today, there have been over 7 million SARS-CoV-2 genome sequence emissions. The majority of these genomes were generated with Amplicon sequencing methods. Surprisingly, there are no standardized controls or QC metrics for this data. One commonly used control though, is the use of a water non-template control. Waters are added into certain locations on a sample plate, and if during sequencing it is found that a water has SARS-CoV-2 genetic material in it, then the entire plate is discarded and prepared again. This approach wastes time and resources to prepare samples again, but it does control for lab-wide contamination. This approach, however, can miss contamination events and sample swaps that occur farther away from the non-template controls, leading to erroneous genomes possibly being reported. <clears throat> 
So as such, me and two other graduate students, Erica Normandin and Matthew Bauer, worked together to develop and implement a set of 96 synthetic DNA spikins, SDSIs, that can be added into each sample to provide sample tracking and detection of contamination. These SDSIs consist of a unique core sequence of 140 base pairs and are flanked by constant primer binding regions, bringing them up to 188 base pairs in total. The unique core sequences were derived from diverse uncommon archaea to maximize the evolutionary distance from common human pathogens and eliminate the potential that they would be commonly found in laboratories or clinical samples. We use a permissive blast in search against the entire NCBI database, which confirmed that the SDSI core sequences had limited homology outside this domain and only the genre unlikely to be found in laboratories. We also confirmed that none of the core sequences shared homology defined as over 90% identity over 50 base pairs with Homo sapiens or known viral genomes. The limited homology outside of the domain archaea maximizes the potential to use these SDSIs for broad applications beyond SARS-CoV-2 amplicon sequencing. As the primer binding sites are the same for each spike in, we only needed to use one primer pair to amplify each SDSI. Using primer blast, we predicted that the sequences had limited homology to common organisms and thus were unlikely to amplify off-target sequences. This one primer pair can easily be added to the primer pools for any, amp any short amplicon sequencing panel. We use these primer pairs to amplify the SDSI oligos within our intended amplicon sequencing panel primer pools and then ran the product on a gel to confirm that all SDSIs amplified and resulted in a single clean product of the expected size. We also ran a qPCR for an SDSI seen as positive in this graph in the same SDSI and a nasopharyngeal NP swab seen as NP positive background to confirm that the SDSIs amplify in the presence of clinical sample background. NP negative background was just an NP swab with only the SDSI primers and then negative was purely just water with the SDSI primers. Last, we sequenced all of the SDSIs, so this is all 96 of them on their own, to confirm that each of these 96 constructs results in a unique, robust, and specific signal of mapped reads. Um, does anybody have any questions so far? Thanks, Kim. Nothing is posted yet, but I will let you know when there is a question. Awesome. Okay, so. After this, we worked to apply these SDSIs to an amplicon sequencing panel put forth by the Arctic network. So this Arctic panel consists of an open access protocol with publicly available primer sequences. The panel has 196 primers separated into two pools, which generates 98 amplicons that cover the SARS-CoV-2 genome. This is the most widely used primer set for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing and results in decent coverage across the genome. To incorporate these SDSIs into the Arctic panel, we simply place a unique SDSI into each sample on a plate. And then in addition to adding the Arctic primer pool, we would also add the SDSI primer pair. This would allow us to amplify both the SARS-CoV-2 genetic material and the SDSI simultaneously. If two SDSIs or the incorrect SDSI is then detected during sequencing, that individual sample can be removed from analysis. We term this approach SDSI plus AMSEQ. The entire workflow begins from cDNA generated from that NP swab and tracks the samples during the amplification stage where the highest risk of contamination occurs. SDSIs are added into the cDNA. The sample is split into two for each primer pool. 35 to 40 cycles of PCR are done. And then after amplification, the pools are combined. The libraries are quantified, pooled, and put on a sequencer. The addition of the SCSIs adds minimal extra cost and time to the already existing workflow. During sample analysis, we map the sample reads to a FASTA file of all the SDSI sequences and then count the number of SDSI reads in each sample. We typically recommend a threshold of 95% or greater expected SDSI reads. So a plate without a contaminating event or a sample swap should display a simple diagonal one-to-one -one matching of expected and observed SDSIs. 
If contamination or sample swaps occur though, we can see this through SDSIs appearing where they are not supposed to. We recommend manual curation or resequencing of genomes assembled from any samples with less than 95% of SDSI reads mapping to the expected SDSI. This level of impurity is probably attributable to sample processing contamination, as we saw minimal baseline crosstalk from sources such as indexing primers or oligosynthesis. We explored our SDSI mapping stringency threshold by determining whether each SDSI was uniquely identified over a range of SDSI stringency thresholds. For an experiment where we had sequenced the SDSIs without any clinical samples, we calculated at each cutoff the number of SDSIs seen here on the y-axis out of the full set of 96 for which only the expected SDSI had a proportion of mapped reads that exceeded the cutoff seen on the x-axis. Assuming no contamination, all 96 SDSIs should be identified uniquely. That is, no other SDSI should have a proportion of mapped reads that exceeds the cutoff. So the dotted line here at x equals 5% uh, represents the stringency cutoff that we recommend in practice to detect contamination events. Kim, I, I, I want to interrupt with a question uh, from an audience yes. member. Um, so the question is, what is the benefit of starting with Archaea sequences rather than randomly generated sequences, which you would then blast against known sequences? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and you can absolutely do this with completely synthetic sequences. The reason that we did this, and I'll have a slide on this right at the end, is because we were also piloting at the same time um, a RNA spike in. Uh, version of this. Um, so I'll go over it a little bit later, but essentially we thought if we use Archaea, we could avoid any weird hairpins or anything like that that might become a problem for the in vitro transcription. And so that's why we chose not to go with, you know, completely arbitrary synthetic. And we went with sequences derived from Arche Archaea because we thought it might not be uh, quite as problematic when it came to that. But it absolutely is possible um, to do that instead. Our reason why was just because we we, and I'll, I'll chat about it when we get there, um, had a way to kind of pilot these to also be synthetic RNA spike ins for sample tracking a little bit earlier in the pipeline. Great, thank you very much. So next we began the process of implementing these SDSIs into patient samples. So we first performed a limited titration uh, using 666 and 0.6 copies per microliter of an SDSI into one patient sample mock diluted to four different viral loads seen here as CT. We found that 600 copies per microliter resulted in reliable SDSI signal across all samples and did not overtake the SARS-CoV-2 reaction. The goal with the SDSIs was to reliably detect them, but also still have a large majority of reads devoted to sequencing the SARS-CoV-2 genome. We tested all 96 SDSIs in 96 unique patient samples uh, and found that we accurately detected the correct SDSI in each well with no crosstalk from background material in patient samples. And this is also an area where you can improvise a little bit. So our lab also uses 6,000 copies per microliter with no uh, overtaking of the reaction and find that that leads to a little bit more stability of the SDSIs when stored at four degrees over a two week period. So we don't have to make dilutions quite as often. So after this, we validated that the SDSIs had no impact on genome recovery by running 14 samples with various viral loads through the method both with and without SDSIs. So this plot looks at the mean amplicon coverage over those 98 Arctic amplicons uh, that tile across the genome with the shaded area representing the confidence interval. We found there to be no significant impact on coverage across any of the amplicons with the addition of the SDSIs. Due to PCR-based error possibly affecting genomes, um, we also wanted to look at the genome concordance between samples run with our previous method of unbiased metagenomic sequencing that we are much more familiar with and this new SDSI plus AMSeq method. And we found that there were only two divergent SNF calls, resulting in a very small discordance rate of 0.6%. So this indicated to us that despite the higher number of PCR cycles used in this method, the genomes were very comparable between them. 
We then performed an intentional contamination experiment to see if when we mix SDSIs at a certain proportion, seen here on the bottom, that is what we see in our sequencing output. So the sequencing output did roughly reflect the initial ratios, but we still recommend using SDSIs rather as a qualitative flag or rather than quantitatively to indicate the levels of contamination. So after all this validation was done, we began to implement the method at scale. So we used a half plate of SDSIs across 2,903 samples in our lab here at the Broad and also shared them with our collaborator, Ryan Chewy at Jackson Laboratories so he could implement them for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing in Maine where he provided us the data for an additional 3,773 3, samples. These samples uh, covered a range of viral CTs. Um, they came from numerous states and they had a large amount of genetic diversity. Additionally, the two labs had some subtle differences ranging from performing a CT normalization prior to the addition of the SDSIs, the enzymes they use, the library prep reagents, and even the concentration uh, with one lab using 600 and one using 6,000 um, for the SDSI spike in. So this tended to be a fairly diverse sample set. We analyzed the performance of the SDSIs across all these samples. And we found that the percent of SDSI reads that mapped to the expected SDSI was above 95% for both labs. And this was after removing known or obvious cases of contamination. So this serves as kind of a measure for how pure the SDSIs are in a variety of different sample backgrounds. We then looked at the percent of SDSI reads over the total of all reads, which averaged a low but consistent percentage of 3.72%. This indicates that the SDSIs do not overtake the SARS-CoV-2 reaction, and we can still recover viral genomes while also accurately detecting the SDSIs. With this data, we also went back to look a little bit closer at GC content. The percent GC for the SDSI amplicons ranged from 33 to 65%, which was a little bit wider than we wanted. So we went back to look at our data from our clinical samples and correlated the GC percentage for each SDSI with the percentage of SDSI reads over the total reads, which just normalizes for sequencing depth uh, for each sample. Here we found that the GC content did not significantly bias the number of SDSI reads detected in clinical samples. So within the numerous batches of samples run, we identified some key modes of contamination that occurred during our large scale sample processing. Some modes of error included a contaminated reagent, which results in a signal throughout uh, many of the wells. There's also neighboring sample contamination, which can occur via aerosolization, spillover, or pipetting errors. Um, there's plate inversions where the amplified reaction pools were mixed together, and then pipetting errors, um, which can result in the mixing of two columns. The SCISI plus AMSIC method is valuable for when isolated examples of contamination or sample swaps are found, we can just remove those samples in question and resequence them. With a dirty water control, the entire plate would be discarded. Some of these examples would also not have been caught with just a water control. The SCISIs also work to provide insight into how the contamination happens, thereby highlighting key risk areas during sample processing. Here is another example of how the SDSIs can be used. So we helped in um, if, if we helped in real time with an outbreak investigation at MGH, where the infection control unit there suspected nosocomial transmission. So SDSIs are particularly helpful in cluster investigations, as one would expect numerous samples to have the same genomes. So detecting contamination will be slightly trickier. We sequenced the samples with SDSI plus AMSEQ and quickly identified the cluster. Uh, putative cluster samples are seen here in bold, and the actual cluster is seen here in this dark blue bottom region. So one of the suspected samples, 2834, was thought to be part of the cluster, but we found it was not associated. Uh, on the right here, we can see that our SDSIs did detect one event of contamination in an unlinked contextual control sample. So this is just essentially a background sample for making these maps. Um, as we knew it wasn't part of the cluster, we were able to just remove it from the analysis. 
This example illustrates how the SC size can be used to isolate and validate only samples implicated in contamination events and altogether increase confidence in not only cluster investigations, but genomic data at large. So in summary, contamination happens and it's really not uncommon in these workflows. Um, these in-sample controls add the much needed resolution into sample swaps and contamination events and provide knowledge that improves the QC of individual samples, but also plates and processes. The SDSIs and the one additional primer pair can easily be adapted to other short amplicon sequencing panels with minimal optimizations. Ongoing work in this area for us is that our Preliminary data suggests that an RNA version of this also works reliably and would allow for more end-to-end -end tracking. So um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, so we have this synthetic RNA version and the synthetic RNA spike in can be in vitro transcribed from our original SDSI as it has a T7 promoter. This SRSI can then be added to clinical samples prior to cDNA generation to track the samples from one step earlier in the workflow. Our pilot experiments here showed that in both a low CT, so higher viral load sample, and a mid CT, mid viral load, we were reliably able to detect the SRSI. Additional ongoing work is that we are also adapting the SDSIs uh, to other approaches like tail primer methods and continuing to optimize storage and performance at scale, including lyophilization for longer term storage and shipping. And I want to say thanks again to the wonderful team that made this work happen, with the main players being Erica, Matt, Katie, and Steve. I also want to thank the others listed here for their contributions to this work, as well as Pardis for making this work possible, and of course our funding sources listed, listed below. Thanks again for having me. Uh, please let me know if you have any other questions, and I should also say that we are happy to share our SDSIs, reagents, protocols, anything that's needed, because um, we do have hopes to see such approach is more widely used. Thank you so much, Kim. That was a really wonderful uh, talk on a, on a topic that's obviously both important at this very moment and applicable to so many other things. Um, I know that um, Sarah has a question and I have one. I'll start and then I'll, I'll call on, on Sarah. Um, I was really intrigued by your, your uh, slide about sort of detecting processes of contamination, I guess I might say. And and um, it seems like, and, and you alluded to this a bit, and I would just love to hear more about it if, if, if that's okay, um, mm -hmm. about the geography of contamination via air Aerosolization. I wonder if you detect sort of patterns in the direction where errant amplicons go and contaminate wells, or or may, maybe it's just truly a set of stochastic processes. But I'm just curious about whether you see any patterns about which wells may be at most risk of that particular process on a given plate. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely, whether it's aerosolization or spillover, I can't particularly know, but definitely the wells that are closest in proximity are the most likely to have contamination events. Um, so, you know, it, most times if we do find contamination, we kind of like see it clustering either diagonally above, below, or directly around those wells. Um, as far as like, a, not within a plate, but just contamination that is existing in the lab, you know, in the PCR machine from multiple amplicons from before, stuff like that. So although you might see rogue SDSIs contaminating um, wells of a plate, another thing that I kind of should say is that uh, we also do recommend that you still use water controls alongside this. So don't fill up your full plate with 96 samples, leave a couple of wells open for water control. And if there are other you know, rogue amplicons flying around, those water controls should also then do their jobs to kind of pick that up as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as like patterns that we see, I think the most common would be just kind of like the neighboring wells are the most likely to be contaminated. And again, whether that's via aerosolization or spillover or just pipetting errors, um, that I'm not sure, but that is the most likely event. Some of these other modes of contamination are a little bit more unlikely, but they definitely do happen. And they've definitely taught us to like take certain steps and do certain things differently to kind of avoid that same mistake happening again. Thank you. Sarah, um, if you're able to unmute, please do for your question. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Kim, for such a wonderful talk. 
um, it's, I feel like the whole community appreciates when people have pivoted to these really relevant questions during their training. Um, so I work in the neonatal ICU and babies in their first uh, couple of years of life, if they were born prematurely or have other conditions are at high risk for a severe infection due to uh, respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking about your amplicons and um, all of the background information you can get about viral prevalence. Um, and this past summer, we missed the RSV peak, which typically runs October through March. Um, and, and it instead occurred when all of the uh, you know preschools and daycares opened back up um, over mm -hmm. the summer. Um, and so it seems like there's just so much more information you're getting about viral prevalence in our communities and was wondering, I guess, um, a little bit about how your group is using those data. Um, so how we are we using the data for understanding the viral prevalence of other pathogens that are in circulation? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question also. Um, so like I've kind of stated our group, you know, has now been kind of working more in these amplicon sequencing based methods, which obviously in this instance, you know, we know what we're looking for and we're looking for SARS-CoV-2 so that we can kind of like track how it is, you know, emerging, evolving, changing um, and all of the other things that I mentioned. Um, but at the same time, our group, still is and many like in our group specifically are interested in looking at everything that is in a sample. So we don't do, as far as I'm aware, our group is quite large, any work on RSV, um, but you know, the unbiased metagenomic sequencing that I mentioned at the beginning of this is really, when we do that, we see everything that is in a patient sample. Um, some of those, you know, patients might've ended up in the hospital and, if we get that sample and sequence and it might not even be SARS-CoV-2, it could easily be, you know, another viral infection. And we were able to kind of detect that and see that. Um, unfortunately, like we tend to focus on more a certain, more like a certain pathogen, like one set of, like one at a time. So if there's like an outbreak, Zika, Ebola, something like that, we tend to kind of like focus on doing the sequencing for that. And when doing metagenomic sequencing, we have the added benefit of we can see what this is in the sample. Um, but I do think that it is important that, you know, even though SARS-CoV-2 is circulating, that we we still have people doing metagenomic sequencing and looking to see like what else is out there, what else is circulating, what else is going on. That way things like, you know, when RSV is up that, that we know and we're aware of it and we can see that stuff. Um, our group is not the one doing that. Um, Specifically, it's more just, we happen to find it by chance, um, but I'm sure that there are other groups that are, and if they aren't, then then they should be. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much again, Kim. I don't see any further questions. Um, if you're in the audience and have a question and want to post it uh, right now, please do. Um, Otherwise, I will just um, thank Kim again so much for this really wonderful talk. It seems like the, the implications are um, certainly that we need to be aware of this and any sort of sequencing work and also that you have some really valuable and, and um, practical uh, work that suggests how we can confront and detect the issue of contamination and, and thereby reduce its impact. Um, so thank you so much, Kim, and we look forward to hearing about how this proceeds in the future. So thank thanks you. for having me. Thank you.